Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks to us. We thank you that you are a God who we can come to face to face. And as we listen to your word this morning, I pray that the words that I say would be your words. I pray, Father, that you would help me to listen to you and to speak what I hear in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you if you would stand and read our Bible reading with me today. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You may be seated. The renowned fifth century theologian and writer, Augustine, said these words, wrote these words. How can you draw close to God when you are far from yourself? How can you draw close to God when you are far from yourself? God invites each of us to draw close to him. And if you want to accept his invitation, then today as we look at this psalm, I suggest that you first should consider three things. What do I learn about God in the Psalms? What have I learned about myself? And how is my relationship with God? The writer of this Psalm, he gives us a very good example of, of a close relationship with God. And we learn from those first three verses that he had a deep relationship. He had a great trust in God. He was 100% confident of God's great power and sovereignty. I want you to listen to how this is communicated in a different Bible than the one that we just read. This is the Passion Bible. And this is what it says. God you're such a safe and powerful place to find refuge. You're a proven help in times of trouble, more than enough and always available when I need you. So we will never fear, even if every structure of support were to crumble away, we will not fear even when the earth quakes and shakes moving mountains and casting them into the sea. For the raging roar of stormy winds and crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you. Pause in his presence. The psalmist knows some things from that we, we learn what the psalmist knows. He knows that 
God is safe and a powerful place to find refuge. He knows God is trustworthy to help in times of trouble. He knows that God is more than enough and he is always available to us when we need him. And we do need him, don't we? But do we acknowledge or believe that he will meet us in our need? While I may say that God is my refuge and strength and that he's always present, the question I want us to consider is, do I really trust God? Do we really trust God? And in a similar way that how the, the psalmist wrote, we can answer that by testing different areas of challenge in our own lives against the psalm's proclamation. And by checking in this way, I can learn something about myself. So for example, for me, this would be an example. Therefore, I will not fear, even though I have just landed in Auckland on my way to America and have discovered that I need a visa to get on my connecting flight. Therefore, I will not fear, though someone I love deeply is on a destructive pathway. The psalmist's bold claim, we will not fear, is confronting to me because there's many different circumstances in my life when I do feel fear. If I were to let these fears go unchecked, what would happen? Those fears would grow. They'd become seeds of anxiety in me. The sensation of anxiety sets off a domino effect in me, an effect of physical ailments that become a vicious cycle of being stressed about how the anxiety is affecting me. And all of this tells me something about myself. I am a person who is impacted by fear. Is this fearful, anxious person what God has called me to be? Is it what he's called you to be? No, definitely no. Admitting that I am fearful enables God to use these simple moments of truth to help us draw closer to him, to build up our self-awareness in the context of our relationship to him. What about you? What can you or have you learned about yourself? Have you ever experienced these kinds of feelings in your life? Maybe not fear. Have you experienced them at work, at school, or at home? Maybe fear grows differently in you, making you overreactive, feel angry, or frustrated. Maybe it makes you push people away, or maybe it makes you avoid people. Do you ever feel like fears restrict you, make you feel trapped or helpless? Do you feel like you aren't supposed to even feel fear because you are a Christian? I believe this is not a lack of faith 
but rather an invitation for spiritual growth. It's an invitation to be transformed by, transformed by the active presence of God in our lives. Why do I believe this? Because acknowledging to God that we feel fear is an acknowledgement of our need for God. When we begin to know ourselves, then we can position ourselves to be, for God to be able to, to transform us. Some of the things that we as Christians do to position ourselves are things like we admit our weaknesses, we, we go to church, we, we do Bible study, we, we get baptized, we, we go to prayer, we, we serve others. These are all things that we are doing. It sounds like it's all about doing. But I want to say there is another way that we don't often hear about, but which we see throughout the scriptures. And it's not about what we're doing. You've heard this before. It's about simply being. Being still in the presence of God. And I'd like to imagine that, you know, when Jesus got up in the early morning, it was dark. And it says he went to a lonely place. And I like to imagine this is what he was doing when he specifically chose that time of day. Jesus went to a place where there was no distractions, perhaps so that he could just sit and be with his father. In our world of busyness, do we just fit God in? Like, I, I've got I've to go do this and I've got to go do that. And, oh, look, I'll fit you in here, God, but I won't be able to do it there. Or I can give you five minutes here to just have a little read. I'm not talking about having a quiet time. I'm talking about simply being still to be with God. Do you remember that first verse in the psalm? There was this statement that God is ever present. He's always there. But are we fully present with him? An interviewer asked Mother Teresa, what do you say when you pray to God? And her answer, nothing, I listen. He then asked, what does God say to you? And she replied, nothing. He listens. Listening in silence. Spirit to spirit communication. She said, I think it's wonderful to not expect to hear anything from God, just to feel peace in his presence. Mother Teresa spoke so little, yet most of her life was directed by God. I wonder if, if we, like Mother Teresa, did less talking and more listening, how that would impact how it would impact my life. I'm noticing that people who practice silence, sitting with God, seem to have a, a sensitivity to hear him. At first, when you begin this, it seems strange and difficult to simply, to simply sit still and be silent. And in the emotionally health in the Emotionally Healthy course that we're doing, Peter Scazzaro suggests that this is the hardest work we will ever do. But with practice, it becomes easier to put the voices of distraction on mute. The voice of the world wants me to listen. It wants to conform me but it cannot 
compete with being silent, with being present in God's presence. In those times, God leaves, leads us to a greater place of self-awareness. And self-awareness, it's, it is, it's important. It's, if you can imagine when there's a problem with something and you can't fix it until you know what's, what the problem is. In the same way, if we aren't aware of the ways in which we're falling short, how can we bring it to God for him to change and transform us? Ephesians 4, 22, 24 says, whoops, gone too far, sorry. This is where I'm not reliable. Lily, you know, I'm going to put that down because I might continue to mess up my order and I'll leave it to you, okay? Okay. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 says, With regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We may want to put on our new selves, but how can we put off the old if we don't know or acknowledge it? The psalmist uses some vivid imagery to, to help us to imagine, to understand the, the contrast of what the world does to us and what God does to us, what, what being in God's presence, the impact it has on us. And that is done through a pitcher of water if you remember those first couple verses of the psalm, the first scene is terrifying. The, the mountain is falling into the sea. There's roaring and there's foaming. These are destructive and, and life-taking forces that are around that, that shape the false self. The distractions, the circumstances, the state of the world... 1 Peter 5.8 suggests these destructive waters are attempts from the adversary who seeks to draw us away from God. And so we, we need to heed the warnings in Scripture. We need to be alert and on guard, not just to know about it, but to say no to it. And it's here that self-awareness, as in Knowing what is going on inside of us is so important. So in contrast, there's this first image of water, and the second image of water that we read in verse 4 is one that brings the blessings of God's presence. It's productive. It's life-giving. It ran through the city where God's people lived, in safe, lived safely. While outside the walls... The psalmist said that there was chaos. He said the nations were raging. They were tottering. I want you to get the sense that this stream is central. It is central to flourish to the flourishing city since its people are daily accessing and being nourished by it. But this river is mentioned in another place. This is a prophetic word. It's mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, 1 to 2, where it declares this. Then the angel of the Lord, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. This life-giving stream is in the vision that God gave to John and it describes the daily life that we can look forward to in eternity. It's a flourishing city. It's centred upon the life-giving presence of God that comes from the throne of God. 
We have so much to look forward to. But wait. Why wait when we can have it now? In Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. In the same way the stream is central to the city, God's presence by his Holy Spirit is central to us. We have daily access within us to being nourished by God's giving, life-transforming presence. We talk about transformation as though it is just something normal. But if you see a life changed and you will talk about it, that is what is inside of us. Are we in our busyness squandering this precious resource? Are we letting the life-giving streams go to waste? Or are we beginning to see the value of what God is offering to each of us by his presence? Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to give far more abundantly than we can ask or think according to the power that is at work in us, in me, in you. Being in the presence of God is a transforming experience. And we see this throughout the scriptures. For example, consider the life of Zacchaeus. He spent just one day with Jesus and he went from a curious onlooker to someone who recognized he had cheated and taken advantage of his community. So moved was he in the presence of Jesus that he experienced an immediate and evident change of heart which led to a generous repayment to the community. And what about Moses? We know the story of Moses. He went up onto the mountain and after spending time in the presence of God, seeking more of God's presence, he glowed so brightly he had to wear a veil to cover it. Acts 4.13, when Peter and John were speaking to the crowds, the people were astonished by the courage of these ordinary unschooled men. And you know what they took note of? They took note that they had been with Jesus. You know, I spoke with Jenny King last week and I got permission to share. I told her I was preaching on this psalm and she was happy for me to say these things. And you know, despite her physical despite the physical impact that the treatment of chemo is having on her body, one of the staff members noticed her as a Christian and they said to her, the joy of the Lord is on your face. Jenny's life has been shaken and yet she says, Jesus is enough. She can't wait to give her testimony. Being in the presence of God is a transforming experience. It is an experience for all of us. And transformation can happen quickly, just like it did with Zacchaeus. But more often, it is a constant and ongoing process, like the change in, the, in Jesus' disciples over time in his presence. It continues throughout our life. We've looked at the lives of others. Now I want you to consider your own life. How is your relationship with God? Through the message, have you become aware of anything in your life that is hindering you from growing to full maturity? from knowing that abundance. 
What is God today trying to teach you and me about ourselves, about myself, about yourself? What is God trying to tell you about himself? What we know about God should be impacting our lives. The psalmist begins by describing the nature of God and God's nature impacts his life in such a way that his faith in God is unshakable. The psalmist feels, not only feels, he knows he is safe, he's secure, and he proclaims that God is powerful, reliable, and ever-present. Because of his knowledge of God, he declares, we shall not fear. In verse 10, God gives us a personal invitation to know him. And while I read this verse, and as the worship team come up, I want you to prepare to take time to be still and to consider how will you respond to his invitation. Here is his invitation from the Passion. Surrender your anxiety. Be still and realize that I am God. I am God above all the nations and I am exalted throughout the whole earth. We're going to sing and while the first verse is being sung, I want you to simply be still and listen. I want you to be aware of being in the presence of God. And after that verse, when you're ready, I want you to join in and sing. But when the song is finished, when the words are taken down, there is going to be a music that continues playing. There is going to be some soft music and some soft singing. And in that time, if God has been speaking to you, I want you to not rush off. I want you to linger in his presence. But I'd like to give some instructions. If, if you don't feel that you want to stay, that's okay. If you want to go outside and enjoy fellowship, that's great. But I would like this area to be a quiet place, to be a place, a sacred place, where God can be working in the lives of the people who want to stay and linger. And so I ask, when you go out, would you go out quietly to respect those that want to stay? And in this time, as the song ends, if you would like someone to pray with you, then I invite you to come over to the front or anywhere along the front and somebody will come and pray with you. I'm not going to be closing in prayer because I want us, I want us to spend this time in prayer ourselves in the sense of being quiet and being still.